this and that. First of all, I wanted to thank you guys for all the support on the last video. It seriously means a lot and I'm just so happy to share my thoughts with you guys and listen to yours. I read all your comments and reply to most of them, and I learn just as much from you guys as I do in researching. It's really incredible. I also took your advice and hopefully used it to make this video a little cleaner, so let me know how it came out. Anyway, this and that, along with their plural forms these and those, are words called demonstratives, little words that help us understand what we're talking about in a discussion. Read this, not that. Look at these words, not those. Demonstratives are pretty cool, and I recently noticed something about them that genuinely blew my mind. Here's a table of demonstratives in some languages, each from a different language family. Pay attention to the vowels. This, that. Tene, tera. Ni, nan, ni, na. Inda, anda. Es, rom. Ze, hu. Notice how the closer or proximal demonstratives have a vowel around e or a, while the far or distal ones have more open a or farther back u sound? To better understand this, we need to look at the vowel space, which can roughly be mapped to our mouth. A vowel like e is described as close and front, since we move our tongue close to the front of our mouths. U is also close, since our tongues are high in the mouth, but the root of the tongue is much farther back, which is why it's called a back vowel. And a is completely open, since our tongue's just chilling there at the bottom. Obviously, this doesn't happen in every language, but I noticed it in a suspicious number of them. What really shocked me was when I looked through my conlangs, which are the languages I've made, almost all of which are isolates, meaning I wouldn't have taken words from pre-existing languages. Incredibly, quite a lot of them followed this pattern. In Old Aedos, Eni versus Ena, in Yeke, Kim versus Romo, and in Fritha, Heid versus Lan. So what is going on here? To look into this further, I took 70 languages from 20 different families all around the world, scattered across these geographical regions, and looked at their demonstratives. It's not always as simple as in English this, that, and these, those, however. Many languages encode much more information in their demonstrative pronouns, so I made sure to account for these in a uniform way. Languages like Maori distinguish between a third level of distance. In those cases, I took the closest and furthest one. I also only considered singular demonstratives, by the way. Others, like Russian, have grammatical gender and case marking for demonstratives. In those cases, I had to settle for the masculine singular counterparts, since those are often considered the quote-unquote default ones by speakers. To analyze the vowels in a quantitative way, I used formants, which pretty much tell you how concentrated acoustic energy is around a particular frequency in speech. Sounds complicated, don't worry. When looking at vowels, two main formants are considered, F1 and F2. F1 increases in value as the vowel gets more open, and F2 increases the closer it is to the mouth. So for example, a vowel like E would have a low F1 because the vowel is really close to the roof of the mouth, but it would have a very high F2 because it's really close to the front of the mouth, if that makes sense. Anyway, I found a graph of the average vowel form and values for a male speaker and assigned an F1 and F2 value to each vowel of the demonstratives in my dataset. For demonstratives with multiple vowels like Javanese ika, which is a distal pronoun, I just took the average of both vowel values. Then, I compiled all formant values for proximal and distal pronouns in all 70 languages in a big spreadsheet and ran some calculations. Across the sample, I found that the average F1 value was about 120Hz higher for distal pronouns, and that the average F2 value for distal pronouns was about 300Hz lower. This means that, on average, it looks like vowels in the distal pronouns involve more space in the mouth and a tongue that's further back, which is crazy! To be sure, I ran some calculations, specifically a two-tailed t-test for two independent means on my data, which basically tests to see if there is a statistically significant difference between the averages of two samples. t-tests calculate something known as p-value, and if this number is below 0.05, we can consider the test significant. For the averages in F1, the p-value was 0.00478 and 0.00190 for F2 meaning that both tests were significant at p is smaller than 0.05, showing there is some kind of relationship between these vowels and the distance they show up in, at least in this dataset, hence the title, the vowels of distance. Anyway, what does this mean? I think this has to do with the type of sound symbolism, the perceptual similarity between sounds and their meaning. We see this in English a lot. A chip sounds smaller than a chop, and although you have no idea what a kinkle is, you definitely know it's smaller than a boga. This idea was first developed by German psychologist Wolfgang Köhler, and then replicated by V.S. Ramachandran and Edward Hubbard in the famous Kiki Buba experiment, which goes like this. There's two shapes here. One of them is called Kiki, and the other one is called Buba. Which one's which? If you're part of the 90% majority, you probably call this one Buba and the other one Kiki, based on the first one's roundness and Kiki's sharper edges. Sound symbolism also happens with certain consonants. Think of the famous example with the sounds G and L in English. 
in the words glow, gleam, glimmer, glisten, glitter, and others. Notice how they all have to do with some idea of brightness, or light, or shimmering? Another example, words ending in ump often have to do with bouncy around things. Hump, bump, thump, lump. Literally so cool, I know. And it means that what we call things might not be completely arbitrary. So again, I think this is why smaller vowels like e tend to be in words that refer to smaller distances like this, while bigger ones like a and o tend to be in words referring to bigger distances like that. A crazy theory I have zero evidence for but thought of one day is that it could have to do with how we subconsciously perceive the space created in our mouths. E leaves a small distance between the tongue and roof of the mouth, while A and O leave bigger spaces. This is also how a lot of diminutives, which are pretty much words for quote unquote smaller or cuter things in a lot of languages, are formed, since we've seen that sounds around E are often thought of as smaller. Consider these examples Mesa, Mesita, Bahar, Buhaira, Kedi, Kedijik, Lintu, Lintonen, Shakahikan, Shakahikanish. And of course, this doesn't always happen like in Ikeaoshi, a Bantu language where actually the opposite pattern happens, just like how Kyrgyz does the demonstratives the other way around, where this is roughly bul, and that is tigil, but we clearly see a trend in the other examples. And in Spanish, coincidentally, the augmentative, which is pretty much the opposite of the diminutive to make something bigger, is formed with the back vowel o, as in perro becoming perron, which is a huge, massive demon dog. So yeah, smaller vowels, smaller distances. Although this is extremely cool, for now, it is just a pattern and it's important to understand that we can only apply this to masculine, nominative, binomial, demonstrative pairs. Further research would be needed to investigate the relationship in other categories. For example, here are the feminine versions of the Russian demonstratives, note their vowels. This is a whole bunch of work into an unfortunately underexplored field, which I wouldn't yet fully know how to approach, so I invite you guys to brainstorm in the comment section down below. Because again, I read all of my comments and reply to most of them, so feel free to ask questions, share your thoughts, or recommend a topic for me to cover. Anyway, finals are about to start here where I live, so expect the next upload to be a little late, but not super late. It's just that, you know, finals are finals. But yeah. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, and hopefully see you soon. Bye bye!